Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Charles Johnston and I've got the pleasure of uh, chairing this afternoon's session. Um, can I start just by encouraging you, you to use the hashtags? So that's TCP webinars and 20 minute neighborhoods. And also to thank the sponsors of this event, uh, David Locke Associates, um, Ipswich Central and Sport England um, their sponsorship has enabled it to be a, a free attendance, which um, we hope is helpful. Um, so this afternoon, we've got three experts um, to share their knowledge and experience with us on how to put the, the concept of 20 minute neighbourhoods into practice. In my role at Sport England, I'm seeing a really strong growing interest uh, right across the country, including the adoption of the, um, the principles here with a number of cities such as Birmingham and Exeter. Um, I think that approach is really driven by the focus that we've seen in the last year on local green and blue space and outdoor activity uh, in the pandemic and a realization by a lot of people that <clears throat> walking to their local amenities is, is actually enjoyable as well as good for them. So um, hopefully we've got some momentum to build on. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers this afternoon I'd like to introduce the first of those then, uh, Dr. Andy Cope. Uh, Andy is Director of Evidence and Insight at Sustrans and is an internationally recognized expert on the research and evaluation on active travel. And Andy's going to talk to us on 20 minute neighborhoods as part of a green and just recovery. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Charles, uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak today. Um, I Great, that was good to see my slide. So, yeah, as Charles said, um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the 20-minute neighbourhood in the context of it being part of a green and just recovery. Um, so if you can move on to my next slide, I thought that uh, the, the first uh, point to start with was, was to talk about the broad premise of fairness. What am I talking about when we talk about green and just uh, recovery? So in the context of transport and livability. So in transport, from transport's perspective, everyone should have an equal right of access to employment, to goods, to services, to leisure, to social networks, to the things that we want to be able to access. And in terms of livability, we all have the right to live in clean, healthy, safe, and happy uh, places and quite fundamentally and possibly quite challengingly in a way everyone can thrive without needing a car um if you could move us on uh please next slide thank you um i just wanted to talk ever so briefly about uh, sustrans and, uh, and, and 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 what we're doing this is uh, a map of our uh, theory of change um if you start with the purple bubbles sort of in the top at the middle uh, and move through the um what color that is lilac uh, and through to the to the orange bubbles that's setting out our principles our values our enablers um and ultimately the blue uh, circles are the, the outcomes. I appreciate you can't see any of the detail in there, but I just wanted, uh, if we could move on to my next slide, I'm just zooming in on those tangerine uh, bubbles there. We've got two strategic priorities. Uh, the first of them is paths for everyone. Uh, those of you who know Sustrans will know that Sustrans is best known for the national cycle network, arguably um, the, uh, the network of routes around the UK um, that, uh, that are, are more heavily used by pedestrians than they are uh, cyclists actually. Actually, um, but, uh, but a national institution, we like to think of it as. Um, but this, the second of our strategic priorities is this livable cities and towns for everyone uh, idea, places that connect us to each other and to what we need, where we can thrive without needing a car. So we've, we've been um, focusing very much on, uh, on, on, on articulating what we mean by livable cities and towns for everyone. Um, but the next few slides are, are just to set into context uh, the, uh, the justness or otherwise. Um, I think there are, there are five charts. None of these are Sustrans charts. I've stolen them off uh, other people. Uh, apologies to those people. Um, and you may well have seen all of them or some of them uh, before. Um, this is uh, from ONS. Uh, I think it's from the Marmot report, actually. Um, and all this is showing us um, is, is, uh, is a take on fairness and, and uh, whether the system that we're 
uh, living and operating in at the moment uh, is, is fair. On the left hand side, you've got the most deprived uh, communities. On the right hand side, you've got the most, uh, the, the least deprived communities. And the green bars are life expectancy in those areas. And you can see the dramatic differences uh, between life expectancy. Uh, in the most deprived and, and the least deprived areas, and in fact, the uh, the discrepancy between male and female uh, life expectancy, we know all that is fairly well established uh, as, as as fact. Um, the next slide, the next uh, chart, please. Oh, thank you. Um, Physical activity is one of the most important ways to stay healthy. Again, I don't think that will surprise anybody. Uh, this is a derivative of some Sport England material. The pink bars basically are showing us the people who are inactive. Um, again, I appreciate you won't be able to see the numbers on the bottom, but uh, from left to right, you've got 16 to 24 year olds, 24 to 34 year olds, uh, 35 to 44 year olds, and going up to the 85 pluses on the, on the right hand side. And you can see that the proportion of inactive people uh, increases uh, quite dramatically actually as you move through uh, through the age ranges and again how, how, how can we um, how should we articulate the extent of fairness that's reflected in a, in a society where inactivity is so prevalent among uh, such large parts of the population if we could move on to the next slide please um, and, and this is where uh, uh, the COVID starts to come into play. Again, we've got on the left-hand side, the most deprived areas, and on the right-hand side, the least uh, deprived areas. And you can see the, uh, the, the, the lighter green bar in the middle there is the uh, extent of, uh, of impact of COVID uh, in these different areas. And you can see a disproportionate effect again in the most deprived communities. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, just trying to set this context for, uh, for, for what I'm gonna go on and talk about. And the next slide, please. And again, in respect to physical activity, uh, we've got data here, uh, again, from Sport England uh, survey work, um, looking at the, the change in levels of physical activity um, during the, the first uh, lockdown, or at this time last year. Um, and uh, again, showing you uh, the extent of differences uh, in, in different social groups. So it's not quite so clear cut uh, that um, that the extent of, um, uh, of of decrease in levels of physical activity is more marked among lower social groups. That appears to be slightly more evenly spread across the whole population. There is a clear difference, um, but, um, but but not so pronounced as some of the some of the other data that we looked at. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, again, just looking at the proportions of people who are inactive uh, and and how that plays out. Um, across across the age range and we've seen in the earlier slide that there are large parts of the population that are inactive particularly as as, as we move towards the older age groups um, but it's that little blue slice on the top of the purple uh, bars that's uh, that's critical here the the extent of increase um, from pre-lockdown to uh, during the first lockdown um, and and the slices of those those bars are, are, are very pronounced in um, in several of the age groups, but most particularly, I think the 25 to 34 years and the 65 to 74 and 75 to 84 uh, years sectors. So again, uh, um, a, a, a distribution of effect that is not even across the across the wider population. Okay, if we could have the next slide, please. So what is Sustrans thinking about in, uh, in, in, the, in the context of, uh, of, of green and just recovery in the context of fairness? Um, we're, we're working to create livable cities and towns for everyone. Our view of these places is that they've got to be places that connect us to each other and to what we need. And again, at that point where we're going to thrive without having to use a car. And next slide, please. How we articulate that? What 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 makes a livable city or town for everyone? What are the characteristics that we're looking for? It's a thing about social connection. It's about people being able to engage with uh, with the people in their communities, um, about being able to access the services, uh, use the facilities, um, and about feeling part of their community. 
The second one is is uh, the, the, the livable community will have most of what you need just a short walk away, and that's really where the twenty minute neighbourhood come, principle comes into play. Making sure that people can access, okay, realistically, as we've discussed this morning, not everything that you could possibly imagine that you would ever need within a twenty minute walk, but the fundamentals and how you define the fundamentals is again open to debate. Um, but again, the broad principle of having a lot of the thing you need within a relatively short distance again it's what we've been talking about all, all, all day at this conference really so uh, no news there um the third point has roots and celebrates its unique character it's really capturing the essence of, of place and it's that fundamental thing about what uh, what what a place is and uh, how we uh, think of the places that we live what makes them distinct um and uh you know we, all of the areas that, uh, that, that Sustrans works with, or that we all work with, have their own characteristics and something worthy of, uh, of, of celebration and something that makes us feel distinct in our localities. The fourth point is easy for, move, for everyone to move around healthily in. Uh, again, with Sustrans, you kind of expect us to say that sort of thing, but I think it's really important to, to emphasise that point, that people need spaces to be able to move around and to feel safe while they're moving around. And the fifth point is uh, a place should have clean air and green space for everybody to live and play in. Uh, the connection to, uh, to to green space we we uh, probably appreciate more now than uh, maybe at any time we have done uh, in in the past uh, with with the um, the fact of the pandemic and, and our awareness now of the importance of uh, of green space in people's uh, well being and air quality. Of course, is um, is is that issue that just will never go away. Really interesting to see how air quality has changed at various points during different lockdown periods and what have you. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So as part of our thinking about, um, about livable cities and towns for everyone, and as part of our thinking around uh, what comes after the first lockdown in, in this instance, um, during the course of the autumn, we published uh, this document, a green and just recovery, healthier places and, and, and better transport. Uh, the the um, it's available on the on the Sustrans uh, website and there's a link in the slide. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, there are four uh, solutions that we've suggested um, need to be part of, um, of of the green and just recovery. The first one in red is the one that really speaks to the twenty minute neighbourhoods. The other three I won't really be talking about today, but just to, uh, to quickly touch on them, a green and just revolution in transport demand and investment. Uh, the investment that we've got planned in transport in the UK doesn't really align with the targets that we've got for decarbonisation or reducing inequality. So I mean, particularly you think about the roads investment strategy and the, the billions of pounds that we're pouring into that. And um, it, it doesn't reconcile easily, particularly with decarbonisation targets, but also with uh, a range of targets about uh, quality about reducing inequality all those kind of things uh, the third solution ensuring the fiscal incentives favor public transport walking and cycling um, again and many of you will be aware that driving is effectively subsidized um, so the uh, okay the cost to people's health and the environment are borne elsewhere and by others who, who, who don't drive or who drive less um, and you know the, it, again it's this disparity of uh, of, of, of um, uh, of equality, really, that, uh, that, that that feels unfair and needs to be part of that green and just recovery. Um, and the fourth point, um, the Green New Deal for jobs and skills. Uh, there's a real opportunity to invest in uh, in the infrastructure for, uh, for for active travel, particularly, but more widely in this 20 minute neighbourhood uh, principle. Um, and uh, there's a great deal of opportunity there to uh, to, to uh, create employment. I've talked about those three more than I meant to, but um, but the the first one, the plan for healthier places in and living locally designed around twenty minute neighbourhoods. We're going to um, major on that a little bit more now, um, so we can move to the next slide, uh, please. So, what do we think is in a twenty minute neighbourhood? Again, I know this has been the grist of uh, of of, of uh, a lot of the conversation this morning, um, and there are all sorts of different perspectives on what constitutes a twenty minute neighbourhood, what we should be able to find uh, in a twenty minute neighbourhood, and we've identified destinations and amenities there in the sort of the grey-ish uh, bubbles on the on the top part of that slide and then the tangerine bubbles on inclusivity on the bottom right hand corner um, and of course the transport bit of it as well and Sustrans is 
traditionally conventionally thought of as a transport organization but we consider ourselves to be an inclusivity organization as well um as 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 well as many other things that we do but particularly that transport bit it means about walkable and wheelable for all uh, designed for low traffic volumes and, and, and lower traffic speeds with limited space for car parking and thinking about public transport and cycle infrastructure for longer journeys as well this broader question of, of how we move around um, next slide please so how does active travel fit in um, Again, we touched a lot on, on transport mobility moving around this morning, um, but the areas that we've uh, sort of pinpointed are the areas that are uh, picked out in, in, the, in the slide where I've defined uh, fairness uh, in the context of, uh, of, of, of transport and livability. So we're talking about access, we're talking about it being easier to walk, to cycle, to wheel for everyday journeys. We're talking about places being clean, uh, reduced emissions, improving air quality, and, and there are many other facets to what we might reasonably consider cleanliness as well. Healthy, being able to be active, staying active for longer. Um, the safe part of it, reducing traffic and safer spaces, uh, all really play into the 20 minute neighborhood agenda, I think. Um, happy, uh, happy places. I, I think uh, we take the view that staying local connects people to local communities. So I also appreciate that we don't all want to stay very local all of the time, but we think there's a considerable benefit in, uh, in, in being able to have the option uh, to stay local uh, when it suits us to do so. And thriving. Uh, we think the 20 neighbourhood really uh, presents an opportunity to support local economies. I've talked about job creation in, in slightly different context, but there's also that element of, um, of, 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 of where we spend our money uh, and how we can support local businesses, how we can support businesses that employ people in, in the areas that are very local to us. So we think active travel has got a really important role to play in the 20 minute neighbourhood kind of broad agenda. Uh, next slide, please. So what needs to happen to make the 20 minute neighborhoods work in the context of, of, uh, of those facets that we've, we've kind of picked out? Um, the, um, we're, we're talking about uh, the decentralization of services and jobs, potentially. Uh, I realize that's quite a challenging area in, in, in some respects, but uh, something that we really need to give some thought to. Do we want those, uh, the ways that we uh, distribute services and the ways that jobs are located uh, to be um, fundamentally shifted? And how do we affect that change? Coordination across neighbourhoods. Um, there's an element of, you know, we mustn't turn places into ghettos. I don't think that's on anybody's agenda. I'm not sure that's really a very helpful parlance either in this context, but we, we really do need to think about what um, services and facilities might be in neighbouring areas and how neighbouring areas uh, relate to one, one, one another and what the dynamic of, um, of, of um, maybe reciprocation of services and facilities needs to be between uh, different areas. We need to think about mobility planning, traffic reduction, uh, local networks and better public transport. Maybe thinking about new economic models that reinvent uh, local centres. What do we do about business rates? What do we do about um, what do we do about um, uh, models of, of, of charging for um, online deliveries, for example? Those kind of questions. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got flexible infrastructure for multiple uses, just thinking about how we use spaces, uh, green space, uh, park space, when parking spaces is available, what we do uh, in, in terms of uh, the space that services and facilities need. Um, minimum levels of housing density to sustain local services. What's the appropriate level of housing density that can sustain a school, a doctor's, all of those kind of things. And again, tremendously difficult stuff to shift, um, but stuff that we really need to be thinking about in terms of, uh, you know, what, what level of density, what level, what, what number of people fundamentally uh, are needed to, uh, to support something that looks like a 20 minute neighbourhood. Uh, also thinking about changing planning policy context, a lot of the planning policy at the moment isn't particularly helpful or conducive to 20 minute neighbourhoods and I think we need to think about that. But the last point and perhaps the most fundamental of all this stuff needs to work for everyone and that really speaks to the, um, uh, to the green and just recovery um, element of, uh, of, of 20 minute neighbourhoods. If it doesn't work for everyone, it's not going to work at all. 
and that's really fundamental to get right. It's also incredibly difficult to get right. Um, so we need to focus a lot of time and effort on that to, uh, to, to make sure that we can cover that off. Can you move to my next slide, please? Thank you. So what is Sustrans doing uh, on 20 minute neighborhoods? Uh, two slides uh, follow each with four points. Um, the first point, helping local government and like-minded organizations to set the agenda. Thank you TCPA for uh, for this document and thank you Sport England for, for sponsoring it uh, and for the event today. Um, we're very pleased to be here and to be playing a part in this um, and fantastic to see things moving in the 20 minute neighborhood space uh really keen to engage with uh with 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 all of us potential stakeholders in the 20 minute neighborhood we'll come back to that point in a minute um we're calling for 20 minute neighborhoods to be uh, uh considered in elections across the uk the manifestos that we put out uh, all, uh across the uk for the local elections that are coming up uh, mentioned 20 minute neighborhoods as a, as a viable kind of policy choice um, incorporation of 20 minute neighborhoods into bike life from 2021. Um, some of you will be familiar with bike life. It's a, a kind of a bicycle account report that we're delivering in, uh, I think 17 UK cities at the moment. And it's just gonna change its shape in, um, uh, from being very bicycle oriented as it is at the moment to being a bit more 20 minute neighborhood oriented uh, in future. So quite an exciting development for us there. Um, and providing advice on, on planning, uh, notably for Active Travel England. Uh, Active Travel England is being established by the Department for Transport. Um, Sustrans is, is, is quite involved in conversations about what might be the planning function of a future Active Travel England. And there may well be a role for Active Travel England in thinking about 20 minute neighbourhoods as well. So we're keen to uh, be act active in that space. Uh, my next slide, please. Um, and the final few points, um, we're building partnerships to enable 20 minute neighborhoods, uh, again, talking to, uh, to people, uh, um, different stakeholders from different uh, contexts, not just transport, not just livability people, but all sorts of, all sorts of different organizations working in different spaces, but interested in this agenda. So always keen to expand our network of, uh, of people that we're engaged with. Um, locking in the emergency response measures that support the agenda. That's just thinking about the COVID response measures. We uh, there was a lot of um, emergency infrastructure went in at one stage. Uh, what can we do to lock that in where it's good? Um, there's a lot of fantastic examples of, uh, of, of of new routes that have been built of um, low traffic neighbourhoods going in. There's some examples where they haven't worked quite so well. How do we lock in the good bits, and how do we design out the the, the, the less good bits? Uh, the third point, shaping the opportunity agenda by the, the, the Green and Just uh, Recovery Agenda. So that's our, our uh, sort of policy document in this space. And just thinking about what we can do to really uh, capture the benefits, potential benefits of 20-minute um, uh, of, of, of neighbourhood um, uh, principles. And uh, the last point, working with people and places to affect the transition to, to, towards 20-minute neighbourhoods. We're active in a number of areas. We'd really like to find more areas to be active in. So, uh, if if you're uh, if you're thinking about implementing twenty minute neighbourhoods or how you can make that work in your areas, and you think that transport is key to that, um, then uh, please do drop us a line. We'd be very very pleased to uh, to hear from you. I think that's my last slide. Um, so for now, thank you very much for listening. Much appreciated. Um, I was hoping somebody was going to start talking after me. Yeah, that's my anyway. Andy, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Help, helps when you don't press the, uh, or when you press the unmute button, doesn't it? So thank you very much, Andy. That was a, a really great start to the afternoon. I think there's a good few slides that we'll be, uh, we'll be borrowing from you from, from that presentation and some real challenging content to get us all thinking. Um, just a reminder that all the slides will be available uh, by email following uh, in the end of the session so there's a we'll be able to linger over some of the content at uh, with in our own time but thank you for that so our next speaker is sue morgan sue is a director at the design council and she has led on their work uh, on key government backed projects including the high streets task force now sue's talking to us this afternoon about creating local environments good afternoon sue 
Hello, hi, thank you, Charles. And um, thanks to TCPA and Sport England for asking me to speak today. Um, as Charles said, I'm the uh, Executive Director at uh, Design Council. And what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is about a programme that we've run um, called Inclusive Environments. It's great to see there's so much interest in the 20 minute neighbourhood. And I think from the Design Council's perspective, um, not that it would be a surprise to you because we have design in the title, but one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, is design and design thinking um, in creative, creating inclusive environments and place. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about uh, Design Council. Design Council's purpose uh, is to make life better by design. Uh, we see our vision is a world where design is a force for change and that makes, helps make life better for all. Um, we're an independent charity and we're the government's advisor on design. We work with private, public and third sector organisations to help them use design as a process and a skill set. Uh, we offer strategic design support and advice. Um, and our strategy, as we said, is about uh, encompasses sustainable living, um, health and wellbeing, um, and design skills. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the areas of, the, of our work and how we work. Um, we have our first set of, uh, first sort of Venn diagram, if you like, our strategic focus. If that's part of our four-year strategy, which sets out our main areas of health and well-being, sustainable living and design skills. And we work um, in different design sectors. Uh, so place and infrastructure, uh, which is part of where I'm speaking from today, um, social innovation and business innovation. And we see these things inextricably linked in, in all the things we do. And certainly through the last year and a half or so, uh, we've certainly seen those things overlapping very, very neatly. And we do that through our design advice and programmes, uh, research and evaluation and policy and influencing. Um, so some of the work relevant today, uh, Charles has already um, mentioned that we are part of the High Streets Task Force. Uh, we also work closely with the uh, local government association to help a number of local authorities on big systemic issues uh, like climate change, which is part of our design and public service programme, which we're working on at the moment, and things like uh, decarbonisation and grand ageing challenges. Um, we've also worked with MHCLG on the national design guides and the new design codes. Um, and I think also very relevant for these 20 minute neighbourhoods is our work with national infrastructure, transport organisations like Network Rail and Highways England, um, supporting them uh, with design advice um, and making transport uh, intrinsic uh, to good uh, placemaking. Uh, next slide, please. So just a bit to talk about our programme, our inclusive environments programme and why inclusive environments and, and why would we do it? And this statement on the slide sounds pretty obvious and sensible, um, but we absolutely recognise that in order to create the conditions for good inclusive environments, it's not just a nice to have, it's not just the kind of nice bit of green infrastructure on the edges, um, it's absolutely um, in, intrinsic uh, to making better places, helping uh, tackle social disadvantage, uh, minimising barriers, widen, and partic widen participation um, and help minimise risks to physical and mental health issues. Um, and designing inclusively creates places that are more flexible and takes out the need for sort of costly mitigation later on. Uh, again, pretty obvious, think about it clearly, think about the user experience and get better outcomes. But it also has much higher economic value um, and unlocking significant buying power with people with uh, disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So our programme, uh, Design Council's Inclusive Environment Programme, uh, was set up um, and emerged out of the challenge of designing for multiple accessibility needs, you know, all competing against each other with different built environment experts um, and planners and developers. A steering group uh, was set up some years ago um, and out of that um, research and a programme was funded in part by him at CLG, um, which became our inclusive environment programme. The programme aims to raise awareness amongst built environment professionals about the importance of designing places that meet the needs of, that under, of the diversity of people who use them. 
So we do this by hoping to encourage an understanding and develop guidance and importantly bring about a culture for change. And we do this through using our extensive network of built environment experts um, and recognising our central principle at Design Council that to get better design outcomes, you, you, you need to have diverse and multidisciplinary teams working together. And a number of the speakers today have, have referenced that, that uh, non-siloed multidisciplinary work um, gets you better outcomes, um, essentially. Next slide, please. So you've heard a lot about um, design principles and principles around creating 20 minute neighbourhoods, active neighbourhoods, um, uh, aspects around active travel um, and the design principles that we have in, in relation to inclusive environments are, are five. Um, and these were developed through, um, these are nationally acknowledged principles developed through our diverse uh, steering group, uh, multidisciplinary and our research. Um, these principles have already been, also been adopted by the developer and its Festival of Place Pineapple Awards as a judging criteria, uh, along with Gale principles as well about good placemaking. And we've also used and referenced these principles to sort of help us develop design and sustainability frameworks for work with local authorities, Homes England um, and Network Rail and Highways England. And they centre around uh, these five principles. And we see people uh, recognising that collaborative design and planning rather than just the show and tell, i.e. making more of an effort to do co-creation, co-design, really engaging properly with people and really beginning to understand the needs of people and understanding lived experience and putting the customer at the centre. Um, again, these things have been referenced uh, through other speakers today. Um, our second uh, principle is designing for extreme users um, and understanding the user experience. So whether that be people with disabilities or with visual impairments, um, whether that's people with small children or um, elderly people, um, it's taking the point that we need to sort of understand uh, multiplicities of different uh, users. Um, principles three and four, choice and flexibility are key. Um, so, you know, building entrances, for example, or offering choice uh, for people in terms of how they get to their destinations, um, making sure that there are good walking um, opportunities, that they're enjoyable walking experiences, that there is, it is easy to cycle if you want to, but equally it's easy to actually get on public transport. Um, you can take the stairs rather than a lift, but you can take a lift if you have um, a physical impairment. And I think other aspects of that, the fifth uh, aspect in terms of our um, principles are around making sure that buildings and environments are convenient and enjoyable. And I think what I really want to emphasize there is sometimes we get caught up in looking at principles and looking about how we're going to do the aspect, but building for joy um, and making sure that we're building quality um, and wrapping in um, uh, risk proofing and future proofing and innovation into what we're actually doing so that we're creating, you know, good quality places that can be enjoyed for, for, for long periods of time. Next slide, please. Um, and I've just referenced this in terms of our, our principles and others that have been mentioned today sort of align, you know, very neatly um, around the TCPA uh, principles that um, have, have come out. So we're kind of all on the same page. I think a question that would be great to sort of discuss with the wider panel when all our speakers have finished speaking is about how all the different principles come together and we can make some clarity of thoughts and processes for uh, local authorities, but also for the developers um, around the multiple uh, principles that are out there now. Next slide, please. So without deeping, going a bit deeper into our principles, no surprise that um, well-designed neighbourhoods and housing that supports uh, people at all stages of life is, is, is key to that. Integrated mix of housing, 10 years, types that reflect local housing and the need and support the people at all um, stages of life and needing to provide housing that offers choice and flexibility. And just to sort of flag I think the aspects around housing and adaptability particularly the Centre for Aging Better uh, stats uh, that nine percent of homes currently built in the UK um, only nine percent of homes currently built in the UK are adaptable for older age um, 
And when you think that by 2036, which is only in 15 years time, 72% of the population will be over 80. Creating accessible environments, accessible housing, sort of areas where people are, can live for, for, for a long time and have adaptable homes and houses and neighbourhoods are, are absolutely key. Next slide, please. And again, provision of safe, accessible, inclusive streets. That's been mentioned by other speakers um, and absolutely fundamental to a 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, high quality connected street networks, which give people the maximum choice in how to make their journeys to encourage them for walking, cycling, or public transport rather than the cars, be absolutely essential. They should be in inclusive, should inspire people to walk, including older people, children, and people with disabilities. Uh, we need to be designing environments that are convenient and enjoyable. Um, manual for streets, interestingly, it's, it's, it's going through its refresh at the moment at Department for Transport. But the current manual for streets is only used by about 15% of local authorities. So we are hopeful that the new manual for streets will contain a number of these principles um, and will be more widely adopted and used. Um, I know there's been quite a lot of discussions about high race teams and how we work with them as designers. And I think that again is absolutely key um, in terms of going forward um, and how we design our places. Next slide, please. Um, so on aspects around uh, accessible and inclusive green infrastructure, I know Helen's going to be speaking um, after me, so she'll be able to talk a lot about green infrastructure. But we know, um, absolutely been highlighted through the pandemic, that green infrastructure can deliver multiple benefits, including encouraging active travel, physical and mental health, supporting biodiversity, addressing climate change. Um, and we need to ensure access to infrastructure is inclusive. Um, and also recognising diversity of needs and diverse communities. Um, and our feeling strongly is that, you know, designing for the needs of people, unless you understand their lived experience, um, you can't design for them. Needing to acknowledge the diversity and differences that people have, different backgrounds and cultures, and will have different viewpoints about how and what they do with their existing green spaces. So understanding diversity using co-creation, co-design and really paying attention to uh, people in their neighbourhoods is key. Um, next slide please. Um, and as I've said before about places for all ages, um, a successful place is in one in which people can spend the whole of their lives if they wish to. Clearly there's uh, economic, socio-economic factors around that, but the idea would be offering opportunities for people to stay uh, stay close to families and uh, have multi-generational aspects within that. Next slide, please. And so just to sort of summarise, really, um, one of the things I wanted to really um, highlight in our work in inclusive environments is um, aspects around design and designers and diversity, access to tools and materials um, and skills and capacities, capacity. In our publication at Design Council, Design Economy 2018, we highlighted that 1.69 million people in the UK are employed in design roles, contributing to huge GDP um, in the UK. Yet the UK design workforce is 78% is male, despite 63% of our students designing, studying design being female, and only 1% of our design black, our, our British architects are black. So if we're truly to design inclusive 20 minute environments, we really need to address issues around the diversity of our designers. And when I talk about diversity, it's about skills and as, as well as their backgrounds and how existing designers and built environment professionals can create inclusive environments. So designers absolutely need to understand user experience, but they also need to understand how to gain access to those tools that, 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 that are out there to help them to listen and engage with communities and future-proof their designs. So from my perspective and work that we've done with the Centre for Digital Built Britain, where we've been working with a number of universities and graduates and FE students, it really is about our commitment as built environment professions to address design education, how we procure services in local authorities and in private sector organisations, how we choose developers, how we employ staff, 
how we make sure we access communities and are, are clear on the process of how we integrate diversity into our design thinking. And a lot of speakers have mentioned how we really need to focus on non-siloed working, multidisciplinary working, um, and really factor in early on stewardship, maintenance and management into the design outcomes. Um, curated, well-maintained and managed places generally tend to be more successful. And in summary, other people have spoken about this and it really chimed the chord with everything we do at Design Council. There really needs to be some systemic changes in how we design our places. So place shaping and place making by nature need to be multi-layered and also include social infrastructure, public transport infrastructure and be diverse in the design and the engagement of communities and businesses. Um, so in addition, we are really beginning to see coming through from government that social and environmental value of place and development is becoming more of a fundamental necessity in terms of how local authorities and the private sector access funding and investments. So you just need to look at green book and treasury changes in terms of how investor requirements are uh, being fed in uh, to uh, wider scale, large volume house builders and developers. Um, Mark Carney recently uh, used the three C's, which I think is, is very relevant to everything that we do in the built environment world now, which is COVID, credit and climate. And those another Venn diagram there of those three things um, um, interlinking. And that wider systems thinking and using design processes um, to really support um, fundamental place-based change. So we have the opportunity to do it. We definitely have design skills. We have a number of really fantastic tools. And I think the TCPA Sport England 22 Minute Neighbourhood um, launch today really demonstrates all the different viewpoints, case studies, ways that we can do that. Um, but unless we think to include diverse voices and uh, a multi-skilled, multi-disciplinary multi approach, um, we will still continue to sort of design in the same way. Um, so I'd just like to leave it there. Um, but if you want to, oh, if you could change slides, thank you. Oh, you can skip past that one. Uh, just go to the end one, thank you. Um, if you want to access any of the work that we have um, on our Design Council web pages in relation to the inclusive environments uh, work that we do, it's a free online toolkit um, and access to the uh, database and repository we have. Um, co-funded by MSCG, uh, it's in there, ready to use. And thank you so much. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, you certainly describe a place that I'm sure we'd all want to, uh, want to be living in. And the consistency, I think, with all the other messages we've had today is, is really encouraging. I think we'll come back to your point on how do we uh, drink, bring all these thoughts together when we get to the Q&A um, at the end of this. So thank you for that. Our last speaker is Helen Griffiths. Helen is Chief Executive at Fields in Trust and has represented FIT on um, Government Parks Action Group and the School Playing Fields Advisory Group. And this afternoon, Helen's going to talk to us about how to prioritise investment in parks and green infrastructure. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Charles, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak today and um, for enabling Fields and Trust to, to join the coalition of organisations who have been um, part of the process of, of getting this really exciting um, guide launched. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know our work, we are a UK wide charity and we champion the provision and protection of parks and green spaces. We currently work um, with around 500 landowners across the UK, primarily with local authorities, and we have a portfolio of around 3,000 spaces um, of all different kinds that are protected in, in perpetuity. And I think, as we've, you know, as we've heard from, from colleagues earlier today, it's a really interesting time to be talking about access to parks and green spaces as part of the developing policy and practice narrative around 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, because the pandemic has made us consider our immediate surroundings in a very, very new light. 
And I think that the concept of a 20 minute neighborhood has become a, a much more lived reality for, for most of us over the past 12 months. And one of the most prevalent and, and universal aspects of that has been how we've all used our local parks and green spaces over the last year. I think we're all very aware of how different our experience of the pandemic would have been without access to, to local parks and green spaces. And I think that that was borne out in the, you know, in the few examples where we saw um, that spaces needed to be closed because of overcrowding or issues with, with maintenance um, that, that local authorities were struggling to, to handle. Um, I think we've all begun to see the, the relevance of those spaces and just how crucial they are um, to, to healthy placemaking and placekeeping. Um, I think that we are, sorry, next slide, please. We are all aware that good quality green infrastructure is, is linked to the, the wider determinants of health um, and inequality, and that that plays a, a really key role in myriad public health, environment, and, and social policy goals. Um, and just onto the next slide, please. Um, and that's an integral feature of, of any of any 20 minute neighbourhood that we that we might be looking to approach. There is a wealth of evidence, um, including Fields and Trust's revaluing parks and green spaces, that demonstrates that whilst we all benefit from uh, access to parks and green spaces, certain demographics, including bank communities and lower socioeconomic groups, value these spaces significantly higher than um, than average. And whilst we know that access to, um, whilst we know that that is true, we also know that access to good quality green space is not equitable, and nor is it guaranteed. Um, and that looking at those issues um, is is a really key factor in the implementation of any levelling up agenda. So today, what I want to talk about a little bit is. Um, the Green Space Index, um, so Fields Interest Green Space Index, and how that can help us to, to think about what access to green infrastructure looks like in existing neighbourhoods, um, and how it can be both prioritised and protected um, to help retrofit these places. Next slide, please. So the Green Space Index is produced by Fields in Trust on an annual basis. It will be um, published for the third time at the end of May. And it's an online tool that can help to practically identify opportunities to increase equitable access to green space by identifying areas of significant need. It uses OS baseline data um, to enable us to analyse what the provision and the protection of parks and green spaces looks like throughout Great Britain. The data is only available for GB at the moment, so it's not a UK wide tool. Um, and it looks at that provision by typology against benchmark standards. The benchmark standards that we use to create that analysis um, are predicated on the six acre standard, um, so fields and trusts benchmark standards that are used by about 75% of local authorities when they're considering um, the provision of, of open space in some way, in some shape or form. And the reason that we created this tool um, was really to help us look at um, and to identify where the national, regional and local variances in, in green space provision were. Because prior to the publication of, of that master map from LS, it was very difficult to get a sense of what those local variances looked like. And what we as an organisation wanted to be able to do was consider where we could focus our work in terms of the protection of green spaces in a more strategic way. Um, and to understand over time by building that data set where there might be trends that we could identify in terms of green space loss, where that might be more pertinent for us to, um, to focus our, our attentions. So as well as uh, measuring overall provision of green space, one of the key metrics of the Green Space Index um, is looking at how many people at ward, LSOA or the local authority area level live um, within a 10 minute walk or in the, in the context of, of today's session, um, 20 minutes there and back from a local park or green space that can really help to inform what local planning around 20 minute neighborhood concepts might look like. Next slide, please. 
So the index enables us to quantify what the overall provision of parks and green spaces looks like across, um, across Great Britain. We know that there are 215,000 hectares of publicly accessible green space, which is the equivalent of just less than those three square metres per person. Um, but of course, that's not distributed equally. It also tells us that there are almost 2.7 million people who currently live further than that 10 minute walk from a local park or green space that has been well documented to, um, to derive the greatest benefits from those parks and green spaces if you're within that kind of, um, that kind of catchment. It also tells us that only 6% of our current parks and green space provision is protected in perpetuity. So that's the stable of 3,000 spaces that Fields and Trust works with landowners to, to legally protect um, and ensure that those spaces can't be developed for other purposes. And what the index helps us to do is to, is to look forward and think about what the picture might look like for parks and green spaces in the future and how that might impact on the health and well-being of our communities and, and our neighbourhoods. Next slide, please. So as you'd expect, um, the situation is, is very subject to change. Um, the, the work that we did um, last year to support the second iteration of the Green Space Index um, looked at some population projections so that we could think about how there would be more pressure um, over time put on our existing parks and green spaces. So by 2025, we expect that the number of people who do live more than a 10 minute walk from a park or green space will have increased by um, about six and a half percent. And all of these figures are based on the assumption that current provision of green space remains static, which we know is not always the case. Um, and why the issue of provision needs to be looked at in parallel with how we future proof these assets as part of a collaborative approach to healthier local livable neighbourhoods. Next slide please. We've already heard a lot today about how important the interrelationship of the various different constituent elements of the 20 minute neighbourhood concept are. And that's obviously um, also incredibly pertinent when we're looking at, at green space. And the relationship between provision and access is a, is a complex one. Um, and picking up on, on some of the comments that, that Sue made, um, we know that certain groups don't feel that parks and green spaces are inclusive. Um, or welcoming that they're not reflective of their of their needs and how those spaces would be used and I think one of the things that has arisen from from the pandemic is um, an increasing recognition of um, a lack of diversity of voices um, around that discussion um, and something that that DEFRA um, began to, to look at with um, with a task group that was set up to publish some initial findings um, that we've been working with groundwork on um, later this month that starts to look at those issues in in a bit more detail and to begin to make some recommendations about how we how we can try and, and, and widen that that conversation so that the spaces that are being developed are reflective of the communities that they serve and are, are meeting those needs. Um, and when we're looking at green space provision through the various different um, forms of analysis that the, that the Green Space Index enables us to do, we're, we're not just looking at it from the perspective of the 10 minute walk metric, which obviously is, is important and it's particularly relevant to, to conversations today, but also thinking about whether or not there is a sufficiency of green space provision and whether that green space um, provision is of, is of good quality. And there are um, a few examples on the on the slide that you can see now um, that help us think about what the um, what the picture in terms of green space access might look like and how that varies, as you would expect, very significantly, not just from um, region to region, but within within cities themselves. So a few examples here, um, Bradford um, has, a, has a green space index score of 0.44 out of one. So not quite meeting even 50% of the recommended um, standard of green space provision. And with the majority of the city being very significantly underserved and a very uneven distribution of, of green space. In contrast, you can see that um, in Glasgow, where there is a higher green space um, index score of 0.73, and again, not meeting minimum standard, but it's significantly higher than the previous example, we can see that there's also a much more even distribution throughout the, the city of where we're meeting that criteria. 
But each of these locations will face different challenges, and we know that, that will be true um, across the board in relation to all of the factors that are relevant to the 20 minute neighbourhood, but also in relation to green space provision. Brighton and Hove, for example, has a significant deficiency of green space, um, scoring just 0.36 on the, on the index. Um, but as you'd expect, to a certain degree, very few people living more than a 10 minute walk from a local green space. And all of this data, as I've said, is, is based on existing parks and green space provision. So it really does highlight how important it is that we future proof the parks and green spaces um, that do exist um, as part of um, the new green infrastructure standards that are being developed, as well as thinking about how we include green spaces and their protection in the design of new places in the way that we've been hearing from, from colleagues today. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to give you a, a positive example of some of the work that we've been doing um, to be able to use the Green Space Index to prioritise the provision and protection of, of green infrastructure. So Liverpool's green space provision is below the national average, a score of, of 0.73, so on a par with, um, with, with Glasgow, um, but significantly under, um, under the, the benchmark we'd like to see. And it is serving a population with significantly above average health inequalities. One in six people um, in Liverpool don't have access to a private garden compared to one in eight nationally. And that really does mean that access to, to parks is incredibly important in terms of access to green space and all of those benefits that we know that that can bring um, for the population that we're looking at. And last week, Liverpool City Council committed to protect their entire parks portfolio in perpetuity with Fields and Trust. Um, which will enable 65% um, of residents in Liverpool to be within a 10 minute walk of a permanently protected park or green space by spring 2022. And we expect to roll out the protection of the remaining, the remainder of the, um, of the 100 parks in that portfolio over the following year. So a massive commitment to a green recovery for Liverpool that really does recognise that central role of parks and green spaces um, in, in the pandemic and how that can be part of the, um, the move towards recovery and the move forward. Next slide, please. And so in summary, um, equitable access to, to good quality parks and green space is a, is a really crucial element of all healthy place making and place keeping. But as a non statutory provision, the investment and protection of these spaces is often not prioritised. And it's something that we know is an incredibly challenging um, problem for local authorities who are dealing with you know, very challenging financial situations. Um, and something that we that we need to be able to prioritise by recognising the role that these spaces play um, in a much more cohesive and coherent way. And I think that now more than ever, as I think everybody has said, I'm the last speaker of the day, I think, so I'll say it again, that um, there is so much more recognition of the value of our local spaces. Um, and I think the communities are much more engaged with those spaces as a result of that. The expectation is that we will continue to be more, more engaged on that hyper-local level as the pandemic means that we change our, you know, our living and our working practices in a, in a very different way. Um, and that parks and green spaces need to be a very important part of how we create those healthier environments. So part of the ambition of the, of the 20 minute neighbourhood concept and one of the reasons that we at Fields and Trust were, were so pleased and remain so pleased to be involved in the conversation is around the opportunity it presents to level up access to these spaces, um, to really recognise the role that they play in supporting physical and mental health and wellbeing, um, to building social cohesion, to mitigating climate change at local level and to find a new avenue to be able to put these spaces in the centre of a conversation that enables us to draw funding from all of the different areas that really stand to benefit from us having better provision of green space at local level. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed for that. It really shows what a, what a great asset the, um, the Green Space Index is for it and what a fundamental provision in our 20 minute neighbourhoods so green and blue space will be to a, to a more healthy lifestyle. So I'd just like to thank all three presentations. They were absolutely superb and um, um, a lot to consider there, I think. Um, I think there was some real insight um, to help us with the implementation there. 
and, and very consistent messages um, that we can we can all work to. So thank you again to the three speakers. Um, so we move on to, to uh, the Q&A session to finish the day. And Tim, I think you're going to take us through that. Hi, Charles. Hi, everyone. Yes, thank you, Andy, Sue and Helen for your presentation. I'm going to try and field some questions now. Um, I mean, over the course of the day, we've had hundreds, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I guess we could start with quite a big question for everyone. Um, so one of the one question we had was planning policy isn't necessarily helpful to support the 20 minute neighborhood. So do you think the issue lies more at a national policy level? Or do you think it's more of a local policy issue? Um, so I don't know if Andy, Sue or Helen, if one of you wants to kick that off. Shall I go? <laughs> I'm just hesitating. <laughs> um, I don't know if that, I don't know, maybe it's a case of flipping the question the other way around. So, you know, the, the work that we've done with MHCLG on national design uh, guide and obviously the stuff that's coming out, the codes, fundamentally it suggests that local authorities have it within their own gift to create what they need to do. Um, I would I would also caveat this answer with I am not a planner, I am a landscape architect um, and who's worked in uh, policy and strategy around uh, placemaking for most of my career. Um, but I think I, I want to sort of also sort of challenge some of the sort of the planners in the audience as well about saying well, what, what, why can't we sort of um, bring in sort of some of the aspects in the work that we've heard from today. There's a number of tools we know that uh, from MHCLG, they're keen to see all sorts of aspects of work being instigated and implemented um, in local authorities. So I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chuck that back <laughs> as a challenge. I'm sure what, others have got. Sorry, I suppose the point I would make is, is about the disjunct, uh, disjoint between uh, planning policy and, and, and what we're investing in at the moment. And just thinking about, I use the example of the road investment strategy. And actually we've got big agendas on levelling up on decarbonisation and all these other things. And yet we're still investing in, in uh, intercity roads in, 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 in a very, very big way. Um, is, is, is that the right thing to do? Is that what the intention of the planning policy is? But similarly with, I don't know, taking an example of um, out of town shopping, was, was, we know about the, the problems that that can cause uh, in certain settings and most of the planning policy guidance, as far as I understand it, is kind of um, is lukewarm on, uh, uh, on, on that kind of approach to provision uh, these days, but we're still investing in it. So it's, it's that dynamic of trying to line up the reality of, uh, of, of, of what we invest in against what you know the, what the planning policy uh, is encouraging us to, uh, to to think about. Now, um, in that respect, to answer the question: Does it mean that at a national or a local level? I think it probably means it's a bit of both. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, that doesn't really give you a very definitive what to do next about it. But um, I, I think the reconciliation of the investment and the local and national priorities would be a really good starting point. But it's a massive challenge. Definitely. Thanks, Sue and Andy. Um, Helen, I don't know if you wanted to reflect on that at all. Yeah, I think I'd, yeah, I'd, agree, with, I'd agree with what Andy said out there, really, in that um, it's obviously it's a, it's a national and a, and a local challenge. And, and one, certainly from the, from the perspective of parks and green spaces, where we, you know, we, we hear a lot of talk about, you know, we, we, we hear a lot of talk about how relevant they are, how valuable they are, but there's no real recognition of that when we're looking at how they are funded, not just how they are provided within the planning system. And I think that's also got to be you know, part of what we're thinking about. How do we plan for those new spaces is absolutely crucial that we prioritise green space provision um, within those reforms. But at the same time, we've got to think about the spaces that we have now and how we can invest in them better, how we can make them more sustainable, more manageable, um, and that we can really see a way of um, deriving the, the benefits that they bring to the communities that they serve in such a way that actually kind of releases funding to, for, for their ongoing support, because we do know that they make such savings elsewhere for us, but we're, we're not kind of making those connections sufficiently to be able to, to leverage access to, you know, to the funding that could really help to support them. 
And I think that's where um, I think we've got to get joined up policy right across government and then for the for the planning to to reflect that. So I think um, um, where we've got disjointed individual initiatives, that isn't really helping this sort of coherent picture that we're talking about. But if we can get all those joined together, then and the planning both local and uh, centrally to um, to reflect that, and I think we'll meet we'll make some um, real headway in this. Uh, but without that, I think we'll be we'll be picking away at individual departments across government rather than um, being able to talk with one common agenda. Thanks, Charles and Helen. Andy, we've got one about active travel for you in particular. Um, we've quite a few comments about things about. Uh, e-scooters and skateboards so thinking about active travel more than just cycling and walking infrastructure um, and how we should be thinking about mobility lanes instead of just walking past and cycling past so I don't know if you have any thoughts and reflections on, on that kind of area. Um, yeah I mean the, the, the I, I think it's I think the essence of it is is how people get around and uh, without doing any harm to uh, other people who are in that space or so trying to move around as well um so that in, i mean in that sense it, it's it's worth bearing in mind that um around about a third of people don't have access to a car um so all of the planning that we do that's on on, on the basis of, uh, of of road building for uh for cars immediately um sort of excludes uh, a third of people potentially um so you know it's if, whilst we're not on an, an anti-car campaign i absolutely accept that some people really do need a car to be able to get around and to access the services and, and we, we mustn't overlook that fact um the 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 other part of it of um of, of kind of how do we accommodate people uh who who, who don't have that option um and um Walking and cycling are the obvious uh, part of that. Uh, public transport, of course, a crucial part of the uh, of, of, of the uh, spectrum of provision. But then, you, yeah, you've got all these um, uh, new mobilities, uh, micro mobilities, as we call them, uh, thinking about uh, e-scooters or whatever it might be. And they've got a place. They've got a really important role to play in um, in enabling to people people to move around in in a, in a relatively safer way but it does have to be a, a safer way in in terms of degrees of exposure between uh, the different modes now um, i mean part of the argument would be well there isn't room on uh, our pavements for e-scooters and pedestrians and people in wheelchairs and whatever uh, to, uh, to to share that space um but immediately you've got that you've got a carriageway usually next to a pavement uh, which is entirely dedicated to a relatively few people in cars so if there's just a better distribution of, of, of road space and that was what a lot of the dft uh, and, and other different uh, national governments funding for uh, road space reallocation measures uh, around the time of the first lockdown was in recognition of the fact that actually we you know we, we need a better distribution of space between uh, people using all the various different uh, means to to get around as well as enabling social distancing of course um, yeah brilliant thanks Andy um, Sue a question that came up earlier which I think is really relevant for this session as well, is that idea of gender equality, inclusivity, diversity. So how can we secure that with a 20 minute neighborhood? For example, creating sort of safer environments for everyone. I don't know if you have any more thoughts on-, oh, on That's that. a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the point that I was trying to make in the presentation is, um, you know, we, we need to actually make sure that when we're actually looking at designing and co-creating and working with communities is that we are firing all cylinders in relation to sort of with a diversity lens on so that we, as designers, we're sort of making sure that we're thinking about different groups, user experiences, that we're looking at ourselves and looking at sort of like who we are as designers, whether it's, um, you know, there's, there's a multiplicity of actors that make up the built environment stage. And I think, you know, if you're sitting, when you, when you, when you speak at events, maybe if you're sitting in a room of, you know, people that just are, are, are engineers or people that are just green infrastructure specialists or people that are just interested in, you know, certain aspects of the built form. So 
that's the first thing to get right is, is to make sure that when we actually start mobilizing starting to thinking about visions for places that we're have got diverse voices in the room because that's how we get better design outcomes in the first instance it's also about using design tools to sort of make sure that we're thinking through processes uh, well uh, so we use our double diamond framework of innovation at design council to sort of help us with that thinking um, and use systemic design tools so using a combination of those things but i also think there's uh, when you when you have that diversity right in terms of the design teams for example it then makes it much easier to, to adapt to the same principles when you're then actually looking at the audiences that you're seeking when you're out consult, consult, doing consultation or whether you're co-creating or co-designing um, and that's everything from where you choose to have meetings um, you know what time of day you choose to start engaging with people you know what, what kind of questions you're posing and I think we all need to take a responsibility sort of making sure that we're, we're doing that in, in, in the best way possible and there are a number of tools and principles and organisations out there that can, that can show us and demonstrate best practice. Um, so I think that's kind of key and fundamental. I think then when it, we actually then come to sort of designing places, um, a lot of this stuff, I mean, you know, the, the stuff that's been in the press about Sarah Everard recently, um, we were asked to sort of comment on that at Design Council, you know, a week or so ago. And one of the comments there around sort of designing places that are safe and, and Judy mentioned this um, in her, uh, her Q&A session earlier this morning, a lot of this comes down to sort of maintenance management, it's, it's some systemic issues around um, gender and diversity in our design thinking principles and how we invest in things, you know, everything from having two people on the bus at night um, to the height of your the stool in a bus stop, you know, it's not really designed for women with small children. Um, you know, there are some systemic issues and there are some very practical things that we can do. But I think that the key to a lot of this is really having a very strong viewpoint, a uh, view when we look at ourselves before we start doing anything and saying, have we got the right people in the room? Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Um, Helen. So green infrastructure and green spaces, sometimes government and national policy and local policy tends to focus on housing sometimes. So we've got a few comments saying, how can we challenge this? How can we raise the profile of green infrastructure and the importance of green spaces? Um, do you have any sort of comments and reflections on that point of the importance of green space, particularly now? Sure. I mean, I think if we if we use Liverpool as a you know as a, as a recent example of where we have achieved something that does feel really visionary and really pioneering, um, you know, for, for an authority to take um, the position to protect an entire portfolio of its existing green space is something that you know, has certainly never happened before, um, and it's obviously happening at a particularly challenging time. Um, there have been an awful lot of agents who've been very active in, in getting that to, to the position you know, that it is, and it is. Um, you know, it's sort of it's coincidence that um, that that decision was taken as we went into the you know, the anniversary of the first lockdown because that was um, something that was achieved by a very holistic approach to looking at all of the different factors and the different stakeholders in Liverpool who could help to you know, to make that a reality. Um, and I think that the you know, looking at that as a as a template as to how you get the community involved in the first instance, so the friends of groups um, that exist across all the Liverpool city parks were fundamental to helping to achieve that positive outcome for their green spaces. I think that public demonstration of how important those spaces are, I think that their commitment to um, all of the volunteering time that they put into those spaces that's absolutely crucial to their ongoing success, the fact that they are, as Sue's you know, already referred to, they are great examples of where things have been co-created by the communities that are using them, and then I think what that resulted in was a recognition from the Port City Council to want to bolster and encourage and support that kind of activity um, and to a certain extent reward it by saying we know that these spaces are important and we're going to protect them but that we had support from um, 
from the from the deputy mayor we had support from the chief executive we had a support from across the senior leadership team at the council um, and from you know and from the local mp and i think it was kind of seeing that all in the round um, as a as a template that we'd like to, be able to take out and engage with other cities it's bringing all of those players um together um, to create that positive outcome but also to recognize that that's not where it ends so you know this is a commitment to protecting those spaces that we hope will create new opportunities for further engagement with communities so a lot of the work that we did with Liverpool was to identify in the first instance where there was very significant strategic need for green space. So where were the communities who stood to benefit the most from having that guaranteed access to green space? And where are the green spaces that are potentially not in great shape? You know, how do we look at this as a way to actually bring in um, an opportunity to, to improve, um, to fund, um, to create new opportunities within those spaces um, that actually relies on a lot of um, input from the local community to build that and that connection with nature um, and that ongoing engagement so I think that if we yeah if we if we look to Liverpool as, as a good example of um, what can happen took a long time um, but what can happen and, and how that can be delivered then yeah that's a really potentially positive way to try and engage all of those actors in that outcome. Can I just add something to that I think just going back to that earlier question about policy I think it's just really interesting. I think it's just amazingly well done, Helen, on, on, on the Liverpool thing, because I think it is just like hugely exciting that that's happened. Um, but I think this, I mean, and you reference it, uh, Tim, in, in, your, in the book that you've launched today around guidance and leadership and, and how you sort of work across, you know, local authorities and bring sort of private and public and third sector and communities into those conversations. But developing visions is, is, is super important and you look at you know Manchester has developed this whole aspect around green infrastructure and cycling and they have a cycling champion in Chris Boardman you know Birmingham are now setting up their sort of national park city you know Newcastle have got some really fundamental big chunky public realm visionary aspects um, you know London has got you know Camden High Line it's got the, the low line in uh, SE1 you know these these things, visions, whether it's green space or whether it's bits of public realm, and getting people behind those visionary um, plans or proposals are really fundamental. And that a lot of, you know, it's not easy. I know nobody's saying the partnership working is easy. I know it's taken Helen ages to sort of get where she is now. Um, but I think it's 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 really helpful having a good vision that people can really get behind. Um, and then demonstrate that you know leadership can, can, can sort of help support initiatives like that and then funding does tend to sort of be easier to get behind a good vision that everybody's brought into. Fantastic thanks Sue and Helen. Um, I'm gonna we've still got quite a bit of time left so uh, another comment that's come through is we're focusing a lot on cars and we need to understand that a lot of people, elderly, disabled, they do rely on vehicles to still travel. Um, so paths for everyone should be surely be for everyone and we shouldn't discriminate against that. So I guess your comments on how the 20 minute neighbor can um, sort of incorporate cars still, it's not about banning them. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Andy? We've invested so much uh, in uh, infrastructure for cars over such a long period of time that we've, we've kind of locked it into the system and so many people are so dependent on their cars now because they're dependent on their cars because we've invested in a way that makes people dependent on cars and that's the, 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 the big issue that I have at the moment with like the road investment strategy um we're investing billions of more pounds so that more people can travel more by car um in between uh big cities uh, at exactly a time when in in cities we're, we're really starting to think again about how we want to move around them um and yeah i mean i, I don't know what to add to my to my point before really it's it's, it's not about it's not having an anti-car agenda it's it's just about trying to um create an environment where the, there's uh, a, a, a fairer distribution of space, of resource, um, and a reduction of uh, harmful consequences of, uh, of, of, of traveling by car. Um, and that means 
support in cycling and walking, yes, of course, but it also means uh, very significant and, and effective investment in public transport, for example. Um, and thinking about car sharing schemes and, 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 and how they can be made to work. Uh, I can see stuff about electric vehicles in the chat panel as well. And uh, I mean, that's a whole interesting area in itself. And people have made the point there that actually there's nothing fair and equitable about electric vehicles because I can't, I can't afford an electric car. You know, it's, it's beyond the realms of the reach of, uh, of, of many of us to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to think about that sort of solution. And then you've got the whole challenges of, is there going to be enough Kind of, uh, are there going to be enough resources available to uh, to to enable them to keep moving? Where are we going to get the the energy from if all cars, if the, the entire car fleet was immediately made electric, we wouldn't be able to provide enough electricity to uh, to power the fleet. Where's lithium coming from that uh, that sits in the batteries? Um, and uh, you know, it, it doesn't really make a uh, it does make some difference in terms of air quality, but there's still a very significant challenge to air quality from electric vehicles from tire and brake wear and the particular matter that. Uh, that comes off them. So it, 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 there, it, it, I suppose it's, it's just that the cars have been so dominant for such a long time that when we start to talk about an agenda that's saying, actually, can we move away a little bit from this? It's really difficult for people uh, to, um, to, to entertain that notion because, because of the way that we've, we've sort of locked in that dependency over such a long period of time now. But I think this, this, this agenda particularly is one that really speaks to how we can start to rethink and, um, and, 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 and just look again at, uh, at how we enable people and, and support people to move around. Brilliant, thanks Andy. Um, we've got another question about thinking again about 20 minutes, 15 minutes, one minute, um, with regard to access to green space in particular, Helen, um, 20 minutes and 15 minutes might be too far. So some organisations suggesting that maybe five minutes is a more realistic figure. So could put in a, put in a number and a distance actually be damaging as a policy tool? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think there's lots of um, there's lots of discussions about what the right metric is. I think that the you know the ten minute walk um, was initially um, from a lot of studies that were that were done into where where you would derive the most benefits from your you know, to, from your physical and mental health and well-being, what kind of proximity you needed to, to parks and green spaces to achieve that. And I think that there's you know, there's been some reasonable building blocks put together around that. But I know that there's lots of other narratives out there um, that you know that support a, a shorter distance. Um, I think that we can, we as an organisation obviously would be very supportive of making that distance you know, as small as possible as you would expect. I'm looking at my local park right now, so that's a very, very short distance for me. I'm very lucky to be able to do that. But um, I think where we're seeing the, the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales is talking about um, making sure that everybody has a park or green space within a, within a four or five minute walk, um, then I think just having the, I think having this on the agenda as an important point to try and achieve to make sure that people have parks and green spaces within a reasonable proximity of home to be able to access them on a regular basis is kind of what we're talking about with the majority of these things. And I think that some of the kind of the nuance between whether or not it's a 20 minute neighborhood or a 15 minute city, um, we're, we're kind of, we're talking about a livable environment, aren't we at the, at the end of the day? And, and how do we kind of make sure that we've got all of those constituent parts in place? Um, so yeah, I would hope that in some places then we can definitely achieve um, a, a, a shorter proximity to, to those spaces. But I'd hope that it wouldn't be seen as a negative to, you know, to have the, the higher level. It's also about what you call a park. <laughs> so, you know, this, a park could be something with a, you know, a kind of a, 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 gated, a gated environment. Um, but you know, there's there's lots of incidental spaces as you you walk from A to B that can be uh, colonised, you know, either permanently or temporarily. You know, street trees, you know, as, other aspects, outside seating spaces, parklets. You know, reusing some of those parking spaces in our streets that we might not want anymore. So you know, there's there's different ways that you can kind of say what what is a green space and access to a park as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Sue and Helen. Uh, we've still got a bit more time, so I, 
theme that came out in the earlier sessions as well um, was that difference between urban and rural environments and it's been picked up again here so I don't know if through your work in particular um, that difference those challenges that urban environments compared to rural areas present um, again I'm very sorry it's another big big question but I don't know if anyone um, if Andy Sue or Helen if you want to reflect on those differences between rural and urban areas? I think, I think we mustn't dodge away from the fact that there are some fundamental differences, you know, and that we need to sort of think about sort of different design challenges and different design solutions. But the inalienable fact is that most people are going to be living in city centres and towns rather than rural areas. So some of the aspects given demographics, and we know that in 15 years time, as I said in, in, in my, my uh, slides, that there's going to be a big percentage of people who are 80 plus and a lot of the older people in, in, in the country will be living in rural areas. So we fundamentally need to be thinking about how those individuals living in rural areas are going to be connected and well connected. Um, and that's something that you know we can't can't dodge that bullet because that's that's just happening and it's coming. So adaptable housing, close proximity to services um, are all going to be key and fundamental with how uh, rural areas are are, 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 are looked after. Um, I guess that all comes down to investment. Um, I know you know in, in relation to sort of public transport, but also in terms of um, how you know network rail and other railway providers sort of connect up rural areas as well as towns and cities. But it's also about uh, NHS and about uh, social care and about libraries and access to food. So these are big fundamental chunky issues that uh, government, you know, do need to think about in terms of grand aging challenges. Um, I haven't necessarily got some of the answers around that because a lot of that is around the public purse and public investment. I think we, we can afford to be quite creative about some of the solutions that we come with. I mean, as, as a broad premise, obviously, people in rural areas need exactly the same uh, sort of set of options available to them as everybody else does. But walking and cycling is not going to be an option for people in very deep rural areas. Uh, um, but maybe an electric bike is, for example, um, the way that an electric bike can extend the range that people are able to, uh, to, to, to travel with the same sort of amount of physical uh, effort expenditure um, might just open up possibilities. So, uh, you know, and as, as, as electric bikes become more popular, as other mobility solutions uh, start to become available, we, we need to think about not only how they work in cities where we've got lots of people and where, where the, where the um, operating models are maybe more viable because of the density of population. We also need to reflect on what the implications might be for uh, people living in, in, in very much less dense areas. Uh, it's also worth noting, we, we, I think there's a, a, some sort of rural transport uh, program coming out of DFT at some stage in the next few months. Uh, I don't know any of the details, but I think that'll be worth keeping an eye on for those of you uh, who, are, um, who are thinking primarily about rural areas. Brilliant. Thanks, Sue and Andy. Helen, I don't know if you want any final thoughts on that rural urban challenge. I think just kind of remaining really conscious um, that even that when we're talking about people who are in rural areas, um, that actually having access to publicly accessible green space is still a very different challenge and making sure that there is access to the range of facilities and that the design of those spaces um, is accommodating you know, as many needs as, as possible um, is, is a challenge and something that we, you know, that we have to continue to be really conscious of. I think I saw one of the other, the, one of the other questions in the, in the thread um, around how we make sure that those facilities are reflective of, of those local communities and you know providing opportunities for people to participate in the kind of activities that they that they want to which you know might not be formal sport it might be that we you know that we need to kind of reconsider how some of the the, the kind of the creation and layout of those spaces actually provides a more inclusive environment for some of the some of the groups that we've identified don't currently feel that um, you know, that those spaces are reflective or for them Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. Um, any final thoughts and reflections before we pass back to Charles to close? I don't know. We see one of the you've mentioned about how we bring all these thoughts and principles together. 
Um, I don't know. If yeah, I think, I think, you know, we, we have a myriad now, don't we, of uh, different design principles. And I think, um, you know, amazing that, that with the TCPA publication, I think it's, it's really succinctly sort of done what it said it was going to do on the tin as it were, in terms of it's a really valuable resource um, to support sort of planners. But I think also we've got the green infrastructure standards coming out. Um, you know, we've got other sort of types of sort of principles around there as well. So I think we need, I'm, what I'm looking for, and I'm hoping that MXLG and their office for place will be able to sort of help us with some sort of repository. Um, they used to be a good repository of sort of lots of resources, you know, that would be welcome. Um, because there's a whole host of fantastic resources and tools out there and, you know, really good if our local authority colleagues can sort of get access and easy access to those things. Um, I know that Homes England are thinking about their skill centres of excellence as well, um, as well as all our member organisations, of course. Um, I, I would keep coming back to also that, you know, to, to, to create really well-rounded design professionals, we all need to think about how we can be more inclusive and diverse in um, our, our individual sectors um, and think about other aspects of the built environment um, and that, that fundamentally goes back to design education and uh, you know, you know, children are not not being taught about the built environment and natural environment and how it's designed um, at primary or at secondary level schools you know you might get it in geography <laughs> if you're lucky in terms of UN sustainability goals but you know, if we're not lucky, if we're not careful, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run out of architects and certainly landscape architects because I believe we're an endangered species now. So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a plea for trying to sort of, you know, get, you know, design education, you know, um, back on the edge education agenda so that we can create, you know, develop the next generation of built environment experts and professionals who can really understand this stuff from the get-go and just assume that you know these conversations what were these all about you know <laughs> the next 20 years that's my hope <laughs> thanks sue um andy helen i don't know if any final comments no oh hand back to oh, andy oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you to everyone. And Charles, I'll hand back to you to close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tim. That was a really interesting session. Um, so it just uh, falls to me really to thank again our three speakers for their really excellent presentation and for sharing their knowledge with us. Um, uh, to the TCPA for for this event and for the guide. And hopefully we'll look back on this day as a real turning point to give us some of the focus uh, that Sue's been speaking about so that um, we really can drive this and create uh, neighborhoods and, and ways that we live, which I think uh, I think we've all found attractive listening to the, to the various speakers. Uh, just to say all the slides will be shared by email. So um, you'll be able to um, uh, catch up on those at your leisure, which will be great. And please, uh, those that are on social media, please do use those hashtags and um, hopefully prom help promote the new guide and this thinking so that we can get some real consistency now in delivery and implementation right across the country. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you again to our speakers and TCPA and everybody, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your days. Bye for now. <laughs>